Good morning and welcome to River City Church Online and thank you for joining us wherever you are this morning. I've got such good news to share on two accounts this morning. Number one, River City Church is growing. It's growing people. I'm talking about more than just Facebook views, more than just YouTube views. I'm talking there's new donors. I'm talking there's return guests. I'm talking that there are people saying, I wanna check you out when we get back into the building. If you are a River City Church diehard, I want you to be encouraged. God is doing a great thing through River City Church. And this church is prevailing during this crisis. And I also want you to pray for all churches to prevail in this crisis so that the message of hope goes out in all communities. So if you're joining River City Church here and coming back week after week, I want to encourage you to step into more this week. You can email info at rivercitychurch.org for kids devotionals, adult devotionals, and small groups for the weekly Q&A podcast and for worship in the living room. God is doing something miraculous while we are staying apart while being together online. So step into something more this week and email me to get connected. And now for the second thing that I want to share, and this is it. We've got a very special service planned for you today. We have a guest speaker, Martin Dam from Stratford CRC, joining us with a very special encouragement crafted just for this time. And so get yourself into a comfy couch and get a coffee in your hand because you're not going to want to miss a single word of what he has to say this morning. Sean's going to lead us into worship. Martin's going to deliver the message, and I'm going to be here to wrap it up. See you then. Good morning, River City. You know, there's this plaque that sits outside of our door, and it says, uh, As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It's this verse from Joshua where Joshua is addressing the Hebrew people and he's saying, make a decision. Today, choose whether you're going to serve God or not, and that's up to you. But whether it's easy or it's hard, you need to make a decision to follow God or not. And then he makes his own declaration and says, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And I've been thinking throughout this, what does serving the Lord mean right now? And Jesus tells us in his own words that if we want to follow him, we need to pick up our cross. We need to obey his commands. We need to love others as he has first loved us. And he didn't say we had to do that just when things were easy, but we had to do it even when things are tough. Because we need to follow his example. And he was obedient to God, and he did what was right and what was good, right to the very end, even as he hung upon the cross. He was still forgiving those who were crucifying him. And so I wonder, what what's my life saying right now? What's your life saying? Is it saying, as for me, I choose to follow God? What's your life saying when you're interacting with the the grocery clerk, when you uh, are out getting groceries, or when somebody else walks in front of you in the lineup because you're trying to social distance and they thought that was an opportunity to cut in front of you? What's your life saying when you're posting on Facebook? truly following him? Are you trusting in him? Are you trusting in him with your finances? Even if jobs are uncertain? Are you trusting in him with your health? Even amidst all the fear 
and uncertainty in this current situation? Are you trusting in him with your future? How about your life? Do you trust him with that too? And these, these are hard questions. But I think that the time has come. We need to make a choice. We need to say, today, I will choose to follow God. And if you haven't yet, what's holding you back? And if you want to, this morning I invite you to pray these words with me. And sing these words with me as we invite God to work in us. Would you pray with me? Holy Father, we want to trust you, Lord. We want to trust you throughout this uncertain time. We want to trust you when things are good, and we want to trust you when things are difficult. But God, we know how hard that can be. And God, we want to follow you today. Jesus, we thank you for the model that you set for us. That even though things were difficult for you, you showed us how to love God and how to love our neighbors as ourselves. Holy Spirit, we pray that today you would give us the strength that we need to follow you. Would you be honored and glorified in our lives? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When the sea is calm and all is right, when I feel your favor flood my life, even in the good I'll follow you. Follow you when the boat is tossed upon the waves. When I wonder if you'll keep me safe, even in the storms, I'll follow you. Even in the storms, I'll follow you. Cause I believe everything that you say. I believe and I will follow you. I believe and I will follow you. When I see the wicked prospering, when I feel I have no voice to sing, even in the want I'll follow you. Even in the want I'll follow you. I believe and I will follow you. I believe and I will follow you. When I find myself so far from home, and when you lead me somewhere I don't want to go, even in my death I'll follow you. Yes, even in my death I'll follow you And when it come to end this race I've run I'll receive the prize that Christ has won I will be with you in paradise Oh, I will be with you in paradise Cause I believe everything that you say
Good morning. My name is Martin Dam. I'm the pastor of the Stratford Christian Reformed Church, and it is an honor to lead you in worship this morning. We're living in unique times. I don't need to, I'm not the first one to tell you that. I heard politicians in Canada ending their talks with God bless. I heard a newscast a couple weeks ago end with a priest and a rabbi saying a prayer. And that tells me something that I already suspected, which is that this pandemic, this virus, this quarantine, whatever words we want to use to describe the time that we're living in, it's got people searching for spiritual answers. It's got people realizing that some of the things they put their faith in, like government, like money, like medicine, like the fact that things would keep getting better and better, turns out to not be true. Which means as a church, as believers, we have an opportunity. We have an opportunity to share the good news at a time when our neighbors and our co-workers and the people in our communities are more ready to hear it, perhaps, than they've ever been. Which means, as Christians, we have to be thinking about how we can be most effective in doing that. And that's what this passage actually is about. And I'm telling you that at the beginning because when I read it to you, that's not going to be what it sounds like. When you first read this passage, your initial impression is that this passage is about a pay dispute. It's going to sound like Paul and the Corinthians are arguing uh, about whether one owes the other money. When I first read it, it, it reminded me of an experience when I got my first house. I got married. I was, I was new to home ownership and all the things that came with it. It was an old house, needed a bunch of work. And friends would come in and they'd offer to give me a hand with painting, with plumbing, with electricity, with whatever they happened to know. And I'd always wonder as they were helping me, was this a favor or was I going to pay them at the end? If I offered to pay them, would they accept it or were they going to show up and announce with a bill? And I think that uncertainty is at first glance what this passage is about. But once you understand it, you're going to see it's about something deeper. So let me read it to you now. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 9, starting at verse 1. I'm going to go to verse 18. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not the result of my work in the Lord? Even though I may not be an apostle to others, surely I am to you. For you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. This is my defense to those who sit in judgment on me. Don't we have a right to food and drink? Don't we have the right to take a believing wife with us as the other apostles do and the Lord's brothers and Cephas? Or is it only I and Barnabas that must work for a living? Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and doesn't eat its grapes? Who tends a flock and doesn't drink the milk? Do I say this merely from a human point of view? Doesn't the law say the same thing? For it's written in the law of Moses, do not muzzle an ox while it's treading out the grain. Is it about oxen that God's concerned? Surely he says this for us, doesn't he? Yes, this was written for us. Because when the plowman plows and the thresher threshes, they ought to do so in the hope of sharing in the harvest. If we have sown spiritual seeds among you, is it too much if we reap a material harvest from you? If others have this right of support from you, shouldn't we have it all the more? But we did not use this right. On the contrary, we put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. Don't you know that those who work in the temple get their food from the temple? And that those who serve at the altar share in what is offered on the altar? In the same way, 
the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. But I have not used any of these rights. And I am not writing these things in the hope that you would do such things for me. I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of this boast. Yet when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast, for I am compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. If I preach it voluntarily, I have a reward. If it's not voluntarily, then I'm simply discharging the trust committed to me. What then is my reward? Just this, that in preaching the gospel, I may offer it free of charge, and so not make use of my rights in preaching it. We'll stop there. The word of the Lord. So, when you look at the passage, you can see that verse 3 is the complaint. The complaint that Paul is making to the Corinthians is simply this. Don't we have a right to food and drink? And Paul spends most of the first 15 verses explaining why the answer to that question is yes. He starts in verse 2. When he talks about the seal of my apostleship is you. What he means is that Paul planted this church in Corinth. If you go back and you study the whole book, then you'll see that, that there's a constant argument in 1 Corinthians about Paul reminding them that he had a right to speak into their lives because he's the one who shared the gospel with them in the first place. And he says that here. He says, the fact that there's a group of believers in Corinth tells you that I've been effective in my work. And then he goes on after the complaint in verse 3, and he asks a bunch of rhetorical questions. They start, uh, I think, in verse 7. He says, does a soldier serve at their own expense? No. Does a, does a farmer or a shepherd take care of flocks and not drink the milk? No. Does somebody who tends to the grapes not eat of the grapes? No. Human logic dictates that when, when someone builds something, then they contribute to the fruit of whatever they built. So we use the human argument, and now he uses the biblical argument. And if you look from verse 8 to verse 13, he quotes a bunch of Old Testament passages, and if I had a little more time, I'd walk you through them, and I'd show you where they come from. But the point is, in the Old Testament, it was very clear that you paid your workers fairly, that they were allowed to make a living off of whatever it is that they put their time and energy into. It ends with Paul paraphrasing Matthew 10, verse 10, which is when the, when the disciples were sent out by Jesus to preach for the first time. He said, don't bring anything with you because the worker is worth his wage. Now, you may feel like I'm rushing a little bit through that part of the passage, and I sort of am, because although he makes the argument, and he means the argument, it's not his primary purpose. Because his primary purpose is in verse 12 and in verse 15. In both those verses, he says, even though I have a right to this, I've never used it. I have a right to expect you to support me. I've never asked you. Not only have I never asked you, but I'd rather die, verse 15, than be denied from the boast that when I preached the gospel, I preached it free of charge. Now, what does he mean by that? Does he mean he never, under any circumstances, expects or accepts support for anything? No. I'm going to show you what he means. And the, the, the simplest thing is to take you back to Acts chapter 18. If you go back and you read Acts 18, it's the story of Paul starting that church in Corinth. And it starts with Paul getting to Corinth and finding some tent makers, Aquila and Priscilla. And you read in 18 verse 4 that Paul begins making tents during the day and preaching on the Sabbath. And then in verse 5, it says that after a while, two men, Silas and Timothy, 
joined Paul from Macedonia. And when that happened, Paul went from making tents to exclusively preaching the gospel. Which raises the question, what happened when Silas and Timothy showed up that allowed Paul to go from someone who had a job and preached in his spare time to someone who preached full time? And then if you jump ahead to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 9, you're going to discover that the reason Paul could do that is because when he had needs, the brothers from Macedonia supported him. That was what Timothy and Silas brought to Corinth with them. Because the Macedonians supported him, he could preach to the Corinthians free of charge. So now maybe you're a little confused because you're saying, why would he take money from one place but not take money from another? And the question is actually quite simple. Paul makes a very clear distinction between what he expects of a believer and what he expects of a non-believer. He makes a very clear distinction between what he'll ask a believer and what he'll ask of a non-believer. When Paul's preaching to non-believers, like he was in Corinth, he wants the message to be free. He doesn't want them thinking that he's entertaining them so that they'll pay him. He's not wanting them to think that there's any strings attached to the hope that he offers. When he preaches that Jesus died to forgive sins, that Jesus is the only way that sinful humans can get to a holy God, he wants that hope that anyone can put their faith in Jesus and have their sins forgiven and be at peace, to be free. If you of a certain age, if you like old music, maybe you remember that, sign, that song, Signs. It's by Tesla. It's also done by Five Man Electrical Band. In the third verse of the song, Signs, it goes like this. And the sign said, everybody welcome. Come in and kneel down and pray. And then they passed around a plate at the end of it all. And I didn't have a penny to pay. The point of that song is that when you put up a sign that says, everybody welcome, and then you ask them for money at the end of the service, you make the gospel that is free sound like it comes with a price. And Paul would rather endure any amount of suffering than allow unbelievers to think that the gospel has a price. To think that it's not a free gift that you can't earn and you don't have to earn and you can only accept and be grateful for. But when Paul's talking to believers, people who've accepted that free gift, like the church in Macedonia, which was started before the one in Corinth, then he wants them to continue supporting the work. He wants their support so that the gospel that was free for them can be free for others. He doesn't, want to give them to, he doesn't want them to give to pay for the gospel. He wants them to give in response to the gospel. That's the hope. That's what has to happen for the gospel to be free. I don't know if you know the history of River City. Many of you know it more than I do. But part of what I've learned over my years serving in this class is serving alongside Daryl is that at the beginnings of River City, it was supported, at least in part, by a bunch of other churches contributing money over a period of years to support Daryl's ministry. So that when Daryl came to you here and invited you on this journey of faith and mission, that that invitation was free. That that invitation had no strings. And over the years, you've begun to support that ministry. And that's why River City, from what I understand, is a, is a financially independent church. And that's a, that's a great achievement for any congregation. 
And now you've bought a building. And that building can be a great tool for how to make the gospel free. I want to tell you a story. A story that happened on the, sun, on the week that I wrote this sermon for my church. A, a story that reminded me how a building can be used to make the gospel free. So on the Monday of the week that I wrote this sermon back in January, I got a call from someone in my congregation. Uh, it was an older man, uh, a man with, with not only grandchildren, but great-grandchildren, and, and sadly, a great-grandchild of his, only six months old, had died. He'd gotten an a infectious disease over the weekend. He'd had a very short battle, and he died on a Monday morning. Now, the parents of this little boy, uh, grandchildren of this couple, they were not churched. Uh, they had a, a, a loose connection to a church plant in the neighboring town, a church plant kind of like River City in its early days that didn't have a building. So uh, the grandparents asked if we could host the church in our building. And it, it wasn't that much for us. We, we opened our doors, we made some food, and the pastor of the church plant led the funeral. And I sat at the back and, and participated like everybody else. And, and then I went back into my office and I wrestled with whether to go pick a new passage, a more comforting passage, or whether to stick with this one. And for a bunch of reasons not connected to the funeral, I stuck with this one. And I preached it on Sunday morning. And, and after the sermon, before the closing prayer, one of the family members of that family asked for a couple of minutes just to thank the congregation for the way they opened up the building. And I thought that was all he was going to say, but having just heard this sermon, he made a connection that I hadn't made, and he went before the congregation and he said, after thank you, he said, you made the gospel free. You took a couple that hadn't had good experiences in church. And you made the gospel free. You took a group of people that were hurting and grieving and asking questions, and you allowed the gospel to be proclaimed for free. Thank you for that. And I want you to know as you continue um, to raise the funds for this building and to renovate and set up this building, that this building can be a tool that helps make the gospel free. Now maybe as you hear all of this, you say, yes, I get this, and yes, I believe this. But I know whenever I'm asked to give, that I might do it, but I do it out of guilt or I do it out of obligation I don't do it out of joy I don't do it out of passion and I know I should but I don't know how and that's on one level uh, a whole other sermon but before I close I want to give you a short answer to that question the answer to that problem to that question is to remember this this is a line from Timothy Keller, a pastor that has been a great influence on me in, in my spiritual journey. He says, the gospel is free for you, but it's not free. It's free for you because somebody else paid for it. It's free for you because it cost Christ everything. If you find that your heart is not in your giving, go back to that. We're a week past Easter, a week past Good Friday, when we remember that Jesus died for us, that Jesus suffered for us, that Jesus went to the grave, descended into hell for us, and on the third day, he rose again. And because of that cross, because of that empty tomb, we know that our sins are forgiven. Meditate on that. Meditate on the free gift given to you. Allow that to soften your heart. Allow that 
to guide your response. And then your gift, whatever it is, won't be a gift of obligation or a gift of guilt, but a gift of joy. The gift of a soft heart who received a free gift and wants that available to others. By Christ's gift, it's available to all of us. Let's make sure that it can be proclaimed freely. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I know people are listening to this sermon from different places. And I don't just mean from different geographical places or from different parts of the house. I mean different spiritual places. And if there are any here, Lord, who are listening to this sermon because they're seeking you but they haven't found you yet, I pray that what they may remember is that the gospel is free. We can't earn it. We can't pay for it. We can only accept it as a free gift paid for by the sacrifice of your son. And may we accept that gift. May we know that our sins are forgiven and be at peace. But for those of us who have accepted, for those of us who do believe, who found that free gift, May we do whatever we can to make that free gift available to others. May you, the Lord of our lives, be the Lord of our giving. May we give not out of obligation or out of guilt or out of pressure, but may we give out of joy as a way of saying thank you for that gift that you gave us that we can't pay for. Salvation through the cross. May your gospel be proclaimed. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Thank you for listening in today. And thank you to Martin for sharing this message that is so important about keeping the message of the gospel available and free in our community. And as this crisis continues, our online communications are a primary means that we're letting you know about River City Church's financial needs. Last week we mentioned that our general fund has been falling behind. And so we want to keep that before you, that our general fund needs your support. Our general fund is important because it takes care of our operational expenses. And so please take time to give after the service today and keep the message free of charge. We want to give so that others have access to this hope that we have in Christ. You can give by going online to www.rivercitychurch.org and click on online giving. You can also give by e-transfer to finance at rivercitychurch.org. Please give and give generously so that the message of hope will not be hindered in our community. And we will be in this community and for this community at the time that it needs it most. Thank you for joining us. Tune in next week because we start a brand new series. It's called In the Valleys and in the Shadows, and it's going to be great. See you then.